Yeah, if you guys could turn to here. Is it good? Oh, hello, Pastor Barry McLaughlin here, and welcome to South by Community Church Sunday School. If you're joining us on a Wednesday, this is being filmed on Sunday, so we have a live studio audience with us today. So if I'm looking around the room, I'm talking to people, I'm not just randomly looking around, so you understand what's going on. So welcome back to the Hebrew study, and uh, okay. Guys, uh, if you could turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to be doing a little bit of a recap because we have uh, several people that are uh, new with us today um, and probably need to understand kind of where we're at and where we're going with the study. Uh, The study is called Hebrews, Racing to Inherit Salvation. And we've said the whole uh, idea with Hebrews, yeah, I can step back here, that's right. (laughs) The whole idea with Hebrews is a future type of salvation Uh, that is for believers. And so as we talked the last couple weeks, we're dealing with Jewish Christians being the audience, Jewish Christians who are being persecuted by their fellow countrymen for leaving the faith of traditional Judaism and becoming Christians. And they are considering a return to the law to avoid, uh, obviously, going to hell. They're essentially turning back to the law to be justified before God. And to be saved. And so to be saved from hell, uh, to be saved from their sins, if you will. And so the author of Hebrews is writing to encourage all these Jewish believers who are being persecuted to stay with the faith. And uh, it's possible, as we've said, that the audience goes as far north as Turkey into these several different Roman provinces. And we know this because uh, it's likely that Peter's audience received the letter of Hebrews and probably read it and so we understand that it's very likely uh, it is a very likely possibility that they could be obviously they're dispersed but they could be as north as turkey and so we've gotten into some things dealing with the author uh paul we've given several arguments if you have your packet you can feel free to read back through all of those but we went through like seven i think it was seven seven arguments that uh essentially i think pretty much prove that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. While we don't know for certain, I think it's very likely. And we also said that it was likely written before the year 70 AD because of the destruction of the temple. It was written before the Romans came in and destroyed the Jewish temple. And so that brings us back to section one. And uh, does anybody remember what we said? What's the coming event that chapter one's pretty much dealing with. It's it's foretelling a coming event regarding the Messiah. Does anybody remember what that is by chance? Anyone can answer, even family members? So. Does anybody know what the Messiah will establish? Dad, can you save me? Yep, kingdom. He will establish the Davidic, or re- reestablish the Davidic throne. So when the Messiah comes back, obviously the first time Jesus came, he came to suffer and die for our sins. The second time Jesus comes is going to be a military conquering. He's going to come back and he's going to establish not just a thousand year kingdom, which a lot of people think it's an eternal kingdom. He will forever sit on the throne of David. And so he is the root of Jesse, the heir of David. And so he will forever sit on that throne. And so we've talked the last couple of weeks and we said, if you notice verse four, he has obtained an inheritance. Okay. He has also become the heir of all things. Jesus, as we said, in his humanity, and this is a key topic that I want everybody, all of our new people to really understand. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, He overcame Satan through the Holy Spirit and through God's word. He did not rely on his divine resources. Notice, he didn't call the angels. He didn't do things like that. And so in Jesus' humanity, he overcame through all the sufferings of life perfectly. And in so doing, in his humanity, he was crowned the king of all kings, the heir of all things. He is the inheritor of all things because of his obedience. And so this is the theme of Hebrews. Just as Jesus suffered and overcame in this life and inherited all things, so we too as Christians are called to suffer in this life. And if we too are obedient just as Jesus was, 
we too can inherit all things as well, obviously within the kingdom of the Messiah. And so the author is using all of these verses to show the deity of Christ. He's using all of these verses to show, if you notice in this verse, I'll actually read uh, verses 8 and 9 here if you want to follow with me because there is, there is a word I want to point out that I um, actually did not uh, mention last time in verses 8 and 9. It says, but to the Son, okay, to Jesus, but to the Son, he says, stomach God, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So that's the eternal throne, the Davidic throne. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. That's the perfection of Christ. In his humanity, he was perfect. He did what Adam couldn't do. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. I want you to focus in on a word here because it's super important. I keep having the urge to get out of my seat and point, but I keep forgetting we're, we're filming here. So, uh, the oil of gladness. I want you to focus on this and the word companions. When it says those words, uh, according to Kenneth Yates, he's a uh, Bible teacher at the Grace Evangelical Society. According to Kenneth Yates, uh, he did some historical digging on the word companions. And so that's a word you really want to highlight in the text. Because if you'll notice, what essentially this is saying is, you, you think of the anointing of a king. You think when David was anointed. Okay, this is what that's talking about. It's saying, because of Christ's obedience, he was anointed the king. He was anointed the root of David. And so he has become the heir or the inheritor of all things. Now, but you have to ask the question, because sometimes we just read over these things. With the oil of gladness more than your companions, who are the Messiah's companions? If you do some digging on that Greek word, companions there is the same essentially understanding the historical context if there was a king who had an estate or a castle and they were ruling over a particular territory a king would have certain lords and other people who were who would essentially function as administrators within their kingdom and these people would help the king rule over and administer his kingdom and so when it says the companions there, it's this is talking about those believers who suffer with Christ in this life and become companions with him in rulership in the kingdom to come. And I want to show you another verse that actually kind of ties in with that. And feel free to stop me if you, uh, at any time, if you have any questions. But if you notice here in verse 14, notice what it says. It says, are they not all, it's talking about angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Who are those who will inherit salvation? Those are the believers who suffer with Christ in this life. You notice, will inherit salvation. He's talking to his audience who are believers. He's talking to people who already have a saving knowledge of Christ. And so therefore, this is a future salvation that these people have the ability to attain to. And they must attain to this salvation in the same way that Christ attained to this salvation. It deals with inheriting all things. And so if we, uh, and, and the, the book of Hebrews gives us a lot of instructions on what this means becoming a, an inheritor with Christ, or how do we do that? How do we accomplish that? And that's kind of going to be really the, the focus of this study. But the idea is, if we do become an inheritor, if we are obedient to Christ in this life as believers, we will inherit future soteria, which is the Greek, or salvation in the English. We will inherit future deliverance and be called a companion of the Messiah. So those who are going to inherit, you may want to make a note in your text, those who, who will inherit salvation or who are about to inherit salvation, these are the same companions that are mentioned in verse 9. And so we didn't mention that last time, but it's actually a very, very important fact to note. And so <clears throat> Scott Crawford, as I read last week, he says this. He says, uh, this salvation is in the future. As companions... The readers will have a rule in this deliverance over the Lord's enemies and will participate in the millennial kingdom. 
You notice back in verse 13, what does it say? It says, to base, it says basically, till I make your enemies your footstool. And that's a key verse to understanding a lot of this passage. What we understand in verse 13, the idea of the footstool, the enemies, is that there is coming a day when Jesus will return and all of his enemies will be defeated once and for all. The Antichrist, the false prophet, will be cast alive into the lake of fire. Satan will be defeated and cast into the lake of fire once and for all. You see, Jesus' redemptive work on the cross was part of his redemption. But Jesus' redemption is not finished yet. His redemption is not finished until he brings a resolution to all conflict. When he comes, and as it says in prophecy, he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. When he comes as the conquering king and establishes this kingdom, the final salvation that this is referring to is when all of his enemies are obliterated and they're put under his feet as his footstool. And so what this is saying is, as believers in Jesus Christ, it's God's will that we are obedient, and if we are, we can play a role in this deliverance. And that's a super key thing, uh, ruling and reigning with Christ. And, and that's, we're going we're gonna to get into it. That's a huge topic. That's going to be a lot of the discussion of this particular class. But that is, that is really what this future salvation or deliverance is talking about, and it's a huge deal. Okay, so... Hopefully that kind of catches everybody up who might have missed uh, last uh, lesson. But as we talked about last time, one of the really important things with learning and kind of figuring out a lot of these concepts is the idea that you have to, in order to understand what future salvation is, we have to understand all three types of salvation. You can't just go with like, let's talk about you know the future type of salvation. We kind of have to get into all the different aspects of it. And so... I broke this down into three terms last time called phase one, phase two, and phase three salvation. And so we're, we're not going to go over phase one in a lot of detail because we did that last time. So if you missed last time, I would definitely look over the notes on that. But we said last time that phase one for Christians is a past event. If you've believed in Jesus, you're already saved from hell. You've already received eternal life, and it's absolutely free. Phase two salvation is a present ongoing salvation. It's costly and it's a continual process. It involves works, not just faith, but works. So understand that phase two is costly. It's not salvation from hell. It's a different kind of salvation. And then there's phase three salvation. That's a future salvation. And it's a combination of phase one and phase two. Now, let me repeat. Let me slow that down and repeat that again, as we said last time. I'm, not, I'm a history teacher. I'm not like math. So this is the only addition I'll have you really do in this class. <laughs> but when it says that result of phase one plus phase two, that means that, number one, you have to be a believer in Jesus Christ in order to receive phase three salvation. Not only do you have to be a believer to receive phase three salvation, you have to receive phase two salvation as well. So it's only those believers who are believers, who have believed for eternal life, and who have uh, been disciples of Christ in this life. Only they are those who will receive phase three salvation. And uh, that involves rewards, which involves the inheritance. And the inheritance, we'll get into much more on that. So if you're wanting to know more, that's actually going to be probably a lot of it in two weeks. So yeah, that does work so very one plus two equals three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I know. I, I'm so glad. I, I tried to teach math a little bit. I'm more of a history teacher, so. I'm glad I teach history now, uh, primarily. But so what we're looking at here, as I flip my uh, page here, talk about the trichotomy of man. We're not going to get back into this, but in my sermon a few weeks ago, man is spirit, soul, and body. All three are separate entities. That's the way we were created, as 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says. Notice what it says. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, Make your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you believe in Jesus for eternal life, um, you receive what's called spirit salvation. Every human uh, was created, or at least Adam in the beginning was created with a body, a soul, and a spirit. The soul is the mind, the inward self, the life. The body is the physical body. The spirit is that immaterial part of man that connects him to God. 
It's, it's that which connects him to God. It's the kind of quality of life that God has. And that's why we were created with it. We were created to live forever in fellowship with God. When Adam sinned, you could put a, I can't do it with this, but you could put an X through the spirit. The spirit died. So every single person is born with a body and soul, but their spirit is dead because it's passed on from Adam. And that's why we need eternal life in Jesus. When we believe, he re regenerates our spirit. That's what we mean by Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, spiritually dead. That's what, exactly what that means. Sometimes it's kind of easy to just look past those terms like spiritually dead, spiritual deadness. That's what that means. Our human spirit is literally dead. Okay, And so when we say we're soul saving, the term should actually be spirit saving because soul salvation is actually a different concept in scripture. And we'll, we're actually going to cover that today. Soul salvation is a very important doctrine. It's going to take us today and into next time to cover it. So, so remember, we are talking about all three types of salvation for the purpose of understanding phase three salvation. We can't understand phase three until we have a proper understanding of phase one and phase two. So... Uh, hopefully all of us have achieved phase one salvation at this point. I said achieve like we're talking about some kind of video game, like an <laughs> achievement. Um, no. So this is a past event. Believe in Jesus Christ and receive eternal life. We're justified. We, we talked about this last time. So we're going to kind of move on. This is actually where we left off last time. Jesus says in John 3, 5, when speaking to Nicodemus, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, uh, and I repeated that twice on my slide, you'll notice, that's a typo, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so it's very important to note the spirit there, okay, this is talking about the idea of having our human spirit regenerated. Does anybody, Dad, you turn to that verse? Which one? Uh, John 3, 5. I will. Okay, can you... Uh, Turn there real quick and read verse 6 for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you'll notice there, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This means that you can't even be in God's eternal kingdom at all. It's not even talking about inheriting. It's not talking about the inheritance. It's saying you can't even be in heaven unless you're born of water and spirit. Your human spirit's regenerated. Can you read verse Verse six. six, yeah. Okay, verse six. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And so that's very important to note. Our human spirit is regenerated at the moment that we have faith alone in Christ alone for eternal life. And so that's, that's the, Im the immaterial part of man that connects us to God, that quality of life that God has, that is restored in us. But if you don't believe, you can't be in God's presence because obviously we're not perfectly righteous without Jesus Christ. Nobody can be perfect, and nobody can spiritually regenerate themselves by their own good works. It's impossible. And so without Christ, we're hopeless. If he didn't die on the cross, there would be no salvation for anyone. There would be really just eternal damnation without Christ. And so that's why Christ is so incredibly important. Um, can someone read Ephesians 2.1? Can someone turn to that? I, I don't have that on the slide, but it is a very important uh, verse. And while you're turning to Ephesians 2.1, I'll read, uh, I'll go to Romans chapter 5 real quick. It's good to hear the pages turning. Uh, and so <laughs> Uh, yes, can you read that? And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Yeah, so notice that. He made alive who were dead. And so you have the words alive, the word dead. Notice uh, verse uh, Romans 5.12 says this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. So death came in because of Adam. This is why Jesus had to be born of the Virgin Mary. He could not be born of an earthly father because if he was, he would be spiritually dead as we are. So Jesus was born as Adam was in perfection. Jesus was born perfect. But the difference between Jesus and Adam is in Adam's humanity, he failed. In Jesus' humanity, he overcame. And because he overcame, we can have eternal life, but also we can have an, an eternal inheritance too. Both components to salvation. 
Notice what it says in Romans 5.18. It says, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. And so some people like to define justification by just as if I never sinned. No, it, really the way it's defined is to be declared righteous before God or to be made right before God. And so when we believe in Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous in a positional sense. We're seen as perfect. Our spirit is regenerated. So when God sees us, he, we're able to have eternal fellowship with him because our spirit's regenerated. But also... Uh, we are seen as perfect. You can't live in God's presence if you're not perfect. And nobody's perfect in their humanity. <laughs> and so only through Jesus, the, the true perfect one, can we be made perfect. And so that's phase one salvation. It's a big concept, but now we move on to phase two salvation. Equally important to understanding what phase three is. And so we're going to bring it full circle in the end eventually to get to phase three. So phase two salvation one word I really want you to focus on, because I may be throwing a lot of terms at you. One uh, word I want you to focus on is the word process. It's a process. It's a continually present process. Meaning, for my life, uh, assuming, Lord willing, I'll be here tomorrow, phase two salvation is a future thing, because it's going to be involved tomorrow. The process is going on and on and on throughout my life. Okay, And so it's both a present and a future process it's in the context of my life here on earth and so the one aspect is that makes it so much different than that of phase one salvation is that it's costly to be saved from hell we do no works it's we're saved by faith alone in christ alone for eternal life it's an absolutely free gift phase two salvation is all about the cost we have to sacrifice our life in this life in order to receive phase two salvation we have to take up our cross and follow jesus christ in order to receive phase two salvation um, we're going to get in some verses in a second here but one super important thing i want you to understand discipleship is key for this uh if you uh are not i, I should say it like this not all christians are disciples of christ now catch that not all christians are disciples of christ if someone believes for eternal life but chooses not to walk through this life and suffer as Christ suffered and walk in faith by Jesus Christ, that person may be saved, but they are not a disciple. Discipleship and salvation are two different things. They are two different concepts. One involves the free gift of eternal life. The other involves works. And so you can't be a disciple without following in his works. Yes? Is it fair to say that some people confuse that phase two salvation with phase one in, in terms of they use phase two as a, a uh, form of test, a testing. So what I mean by that is they, they, they use oftentimes um, situations and verses and so forth as a testing method, like yes. first John, for instance. Yeah. Now first John, what you have to remember, what you're saying is very true here. When you dilute or you mix up salvation and discipleship, right. you actually add works to salvation. Because you're essentially saying that you have to do so many works to prove you were actually saved to begin with. The only way you can know that you're truly saved, like I can say that I'm going to heaven today. How would I say that with such certainty? Not because of my works, not because of what I did yesterday or tomorrow, or I'm going to do tomorrow. It's because I believe in Jesus for eternal life. That's why I'm saved. But discipleship is not a guarantee for me. That's why I have to continually stay in the word, stay under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and uh, stay in spiritual growth because discipleship is super important. Now, one thing I want you to understand before I get your comment, I have to step out just for a second because I want to be able to focus here. Uh, in order to accomplish phase two salvation, the process, there's two tools. One is called sanctification, one is called discipleship. And I just want to share with you a few verses real quick before we, you know, we're going to dive into some of this in more detail. But there are two tools, if you will. It's the idea of sanctification and discipleship. Let me share these with you really quickly. Uh, I'm assuming we have about five minutes left, so roughly. Uh, okay, so let's talk about sanctification first. Sanctification is hagiazo. 
Uh, we did a video on this on Facebook on our five minutes of scripture. It means to purify, to make clean, to set apart, or to declare holy, to make holy. And so the idea of the process of sanctification is that we are continually set apart for holiness in Jesus Christ. We are continually setting up ourselves apart and allowing God to set us apart as pure in his sight. How do we do that? We continually confess our sins and we continually stay in the word of God. Sanctification and discipleship are the two tools necessary to overcome in this life, but also to have what's called phase two salvation. If you notice the first verse, I, it says there, but this is the will of God, your sanctification. Does that mean that all Christians will overcome? No, there are some Christians who will not pursue discipleship with Jesus Christ. But does it mean that every Christian, God's goal for every Christian is to overcome in this life and to uh, receive phase two salvation, be a disciple, and to be sanctified? Yes, it is God's will for you to do that. It's not God's will for you to get saved, be happy about your salvation, and just do nothing about it. Notice John 17, 17. How are we sanctified? How are we set apart continually? Sanctify them by your truth, Jesus says. Your word is truth. We have to be intaking the word of God, believing it, and living it. That's how we are sanctified. Notice Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. It's a continual process. And the thing is, Paul said at the, uh, at, you know very clear terms. In 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I preach lest I should be disqualified. Paul knew that even at that point in his life, after all the good things he did, he had the potential to be disqualified for the reward. So we're never safe. We're never out of the woods. Not until this life is over. We have to continue the process to our last heartbeat. And that's what Paul knew very truly. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 uh, we'll kind of let you read that. That's talking about the renewing of your mind through the word. I'm going to read one final verse, and that's John 15, 8. <clears throat> it says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. And I would read Luke 14, 27. It talks about the idea of taking up the cross and following him. Uh, for those of you joining us and for everybody here, next time we're going to pick up, we're going to look at the two tools in a little bit more detail but also we're going to look at something that's called the salvation of the soul. I would suggest reading ahead, uh, read the verses, read the passages uh, to really understand what this is. Phase two salvation is called salvation of the soul. And I waited to kind of talk about that because you're getting to the point where we're in information overload here. But just understand the soul is the inward self. But it's also the physical life. I would go through and read these verses very, very carefully. I have some quotations from theologians. Read those. I would really study this because this is going to be a lot of information to absorb in two weeks. And uh, my dad will be teaching next week. Uh, dad, you're more than welcome to film and uh, broadcast that if you want. Uh, but, um, okay. So, does anybody have any final questions, comments, anything? I think we're, unfortunately, I took us right to the, to the bell. I think um, when you do that, this back to the math, the math reference, you do that equation one, one plus two, the equal sign in there is finishing well. Yes, you, yes, you, you have to, and I agree with you on that. As Paul said, I ran the race, but even he knew that he could walk away, and he had to stay faithful to the end, and that's, that's a point I want to drive home. Yes. Isn't it fair to say, if we're talking about in terms of salvation and phases, that phase one is the only type of salvation, salvation imputed righteousness is the only thing, that only type of salvation that we can have full assurance of based on John 6, 47. Yes. Okay, where he says. We won't, we won't have assurance of the other two correct. unless we continue. That's works. what I mean. Yes. So phase two is there's no assurance unless we do things like works, like read the Bible, study, be obedient, yes. right? Yes, and that's, then, okay. that's correct. Um, hey, sure everyone who joined us today, thank you for joining us on Facebook, YouTube, and we'll see you in uh, next week's video. God bless you.